I will say something about the possibility of uh, getting some information of extrasolar planets by detecting their radio emissions, which is uh, emitted by the auroras on those planets. First, some <coughs> facts about the Earth's radio emissions. Uh, the, the Earth's infrared output is about 10 to 17 watts. And then uh, the Earth's overall regions emit radio waves with a maximum power of about 1 gigawatt. Uh, the, the number varies quite a lot depending on solar activity and the interplanetary magnetic field direction. So, so, the, so, so obviously the radio output is a very small fraction of the infrared output of the Earth. However, uh, because the radio waves are, have very long wavelength, about one kilometer, <coughs> the number of photons in the radio ra wavelength is about the same, of the same order of magnitude as the number of infrared photons emitted by the the Earth. Uh, whether or not this is significant is of course not clear from this, but it's just a kind of nice thing to, to know, to keep in mind. Uh, and then this AKR emission, or kilometric radiation emission is, uh, the frequency range is 50 to 800 kilohertz, and it's, it's broadband emission. Uh, with, with, a, with a very characteristics. And, and the frequency of the AKR radiation is always exactly the same as the electron gyro frequency at the generation region. And from this it follows that the, 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 the frequency of the AKR tells the magnetic field value at the generation altitude. And obviously it is a lower limit for the surface magnetic field of the, of the planet. So in this sense, this AKR radiation is an indicator of the strength of the magnetic field of the, of the planet. Here is an example of AKR data, how it looks like this. Here is AKR, this is frequency axis, this is time. Uh, so it's a broadband emission. And then, at least when this data was taken, one can calculate from this that there is a quite large contrast between the AKR and the background, whatever the background is. So what is the color? What is the color? It's the intensity of the, of the emission. Oh, it's spectral, spectral density, spectral density in power, power units. Power is that observed from space, actually? Or this is a space-based measurement yeah. by a satellite which orbits the Earth yeah. with a non-directing non dipole angle. Ah. So it integrates at all, all radio emissions. <laughs> so I, I said that the AKR tells about the magnetic field. Yeah, if you can observe the AKR, it tells something about the magnetic field. It tells the magnitude or it gives some, some lower limit for it. So what about the magnetic field? What does it tell about the terrestrial planet? Uh, we all know that the magnetic field is produced in the liquid form of the planet. And so, so in order to have a strong, or not strong, but let's say non-weak magnetic field, the planet must have, it must have a, a liquid core and it has to rotate, not too slowly. Because you need the rotation to, in order to generate the magnetic field. You need to set up a dynamo in the, in the liquid core, and the faster the planet rotates, the, the stronger the magnetic field will be. Although the, the details are not known, I mean, we don't know how the scaling with the rotation rate actually works. That, that's a very difficult problem to, 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 to simulate, and, uh, and we don't know. But we, we know that if you increase the rotation rate, you get a stronger magnetic field. And, and both these conditions are, have some relevance for habitability, because 
obviously, if the planet rotates too slowly, then it has two large day night days in the field. It's a bit inconvenient habitat. And if it doesn't have a liquid core, it most probably doesn't have plate tectonics. I, I say most probably because maybe there is some slight chance that you might have a solid core, but still enough power that it is still enough heat flux that the mantle would slowly convert that you might have. But, 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 but I, I think this is not a very... I, I think most people would say that you must have a liquid core in order to have plate tectonics. And then, as we have heard many times during this meeting, uh, if you don't have plate tectonics, then you don't have this volatile uh, circulation, and then you probably, the planet is not habitable. So, so what, what it means is that uh, when you put all together, it means that the presence of the magnetic field is a necessary condition for, or it's an almost necessary condition for the habitability of the planet. About the uh, uh, core uh, business, yes. uh, in, the, in the Earth we have, uh, all planets are rather different in that respect. The Earth has a, yeah. has a, has a core which has an outer and an inner core, and the outer one is, and the, and this, both of this matter, I mean iron. Yes. Iron. Yes. And the outer part is liquid, and the inner part is solid. Uh, so, but it's all carried quite far away from the mantle. The mantle itself is rather thick. Yes. And that determines, I would have thought, and naively, the, the plate tectonics. So are you saying the properties of the collection of the mantle actually yeah. are different yeah. whether or not the underlying yeah. yes, I, I, I was just thinking that, that, that if, the, if the amount of radioactive heating is small, it would be smaller, then probably the core <coughs> would also become solid. solid. Mm -hmm. And then also the heat flux would be smaller, and then you would have smaller convection. But, 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 but it, it's not 100% certain that it is. I mean, you might imagine that you still have enough heat flux, even if you have a solid yeah. core. I, I always thought the uh, cooling, I mean, it was simply just cooling because of its initial heat, but you're saying it actually is const constantly being heated, so the... Yeah, that's my understanding, but I'm not an expert in this field. From the middle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. from no, the, no, from the radioactive Yeah, in, in upper, in intermediate layers. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure I agree with you that, that if you have a too slow rotation, then you wouldn't want to live there. If it is, uh, uh, you don't have any, you can sort of think about the, the extreme situation, you don't have any rotation at all, then you can always find a nice zone where you could, you could live. But of course, mm -hmm. having no rotation at all is difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. I'm well, but 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 if, you don't have, if you don't have any rotation, then the atmosphere kind of condenses to the right side. Too. And then it's not good. Yeah. You will, and, yeah, and also the other thing I want to say is that you have, a, that if you have subsurface life, mm -hmm. then uh, you know you don't need to go very far down before uh, it doesn't really matter much. Yeah, that's true. Because there yes, is not, yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely true. So I was kind of so from my thinking of, life, from, from, from a very anthropocentric like point of view, yeah, but but I, you could easily imagine. I, I was so kind of thinking more of a kind of human habitable world oh, okay. and things like that. So this is a bit more anthropocentric point of view then. Not, not just like in general, but you are absolutely right. right. But, but still, uh, uh, yes. Okay, okay then, then how, to, how to observe? Is, is it possible at all to observe exoplanet ATR signals? One has to first ask. <laughs> so there are three problems. The first is the signal, so obviously very weak. If, if it's one gigawatt, then it's uh, uh, and ten parsec, then it's roughly 0.3 microns. Uh, and then uh, the second problem is that the interstellar plasma ionized gas. Uh, distorts the, the ray path slightly so, so that the originally point-like source becomes a, a dot or, or some spot uh, which may then be masked by background galactic emission. Uh, and, and this is potentially a serious problem, but, but we don't know. I, I would say that we cannot 
yet calculate the, the, the strength of this effect because we don't know enough about the interstellar plasma, especially about its spatial gradients. So we don't know without measuring it. And third problem is that, <coughs> of course, the host star is also uh, active in, radio, in the radio range, as the sun is also active. But, uh, but this is not a very big problem because there are, at least in the case of sun and earth, there are moments when the earth actually is, is a brighter radio source than the sun. And one example was actually, actually <coughs> this data that I saw. Uh, if one looks at this contrast in the intensity between the ATR and the background, whatever the background is, it's probably, probably instrument noise in this case. But, but the background gives uh, an upper limit for the solar activity at this time, at least. Because uh, this satellite was orbiting the Earth. Uh, I think four are the four Earth radii distance, so one can est one can calculate the relative. I mean, one can calculate that how much uh, because it picks up the solar signal. Just the information of the region. So, so, so it is not uh, not not impossible to. But if you have distant source, can you see when the the, the this star is inactive and uh, it's active? This is this is a. I would say that it's it's difficult, but it's probably doable because the the, the space uh, the spectral properties of this uh, solar and and planetary emissions are different. They look different in the time frequency. I found a bit. <laughs> different figures for this, but uh, one terabot, roughly, but it, it can be even higher, I think, sometimes. Terabot, I mean, the are very intense sometimes. And, and the extrapolation is, I mean, extrapolation, I mean that how, how this scales with the properties of the plan, for instance, the rotation. It, maybe I just said it's difficult to do, and then there are different, different people have proposed different formulas. Uh, and I look at from the Weber formula that people have used, that the power would be rotation rate to power 0.3, 0.8, uh, mass to power 0.3, and distance to the host star power minus 1.6. And then, uh, then they looked at the exoplanets and exoplanets and tried to estimate the flux in milliamps and also the frequency rates. So these are, I, I suppose these are all these uh, giant planets. So, so of course none of them is terrestrial, but <coughs> rocky planet. So this was just an what I gave earlier. So you can actually measure uh, some of these, you could measure the, the flux from these planets? Mm, no one has yet measured any, any no one has yet to do it, but people are continuously trying with radio telescopes to measure. Oh, I'm sorry, so then due to this formula you had, you, you, you made an estimate of what is, uh, what is... What is the expected signal strength? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yes, but, but we don't, there is no... I'm sorry, and, and what was, I didn't understand the, 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 the measurement, was it, was it June years, or what? Uh, the is changed. Yes, uh, yes. What is that? Uh, that's the radio the intensity. 10 to minus 26 oh, watts per uh, square, uh, square meter uh, hertz. Uh, per yeah. Yeah. 10 to the minus 20. T 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter hertz. One, one chance. Key. about possible obs observing techniques. Uh, the frequency is too low to pass, in general the frequency is too low to pass through the ionosphere, 10 megahertz. An, an exception is these, uh, possibly these hot Jupiter type planets, 
if they have so strong magnetic field that the fre frequency is maybe 30 megahertz or, or 50 megahertz, then it's possible to do ground. Then, then the radiation passes through the ionosphere. But, but for terrestrial planets or anything close to them, one has to put the instruments to space if one wants to, to observe them. And then one needs rather big instruments because the frequencies are low. And then, as I said, the, the easiest case is these holidays because they are strong emissions and, the, and they are in a strong solar wind because they are close <coughs> to the most uh, So, so and, and attempts are going on. Try to detect uh, signals, but no positive result has come up yet, to my knowledge. And there is one mission being planned in space uh, called SIVA. But uh, it's not optimized. It's not, as obviously not being designed for it, but it has been designed for also observing our sun mainly. Uh, and then what is important to know, notice this, is that uh, the biggest open question in, in the VCT, I mean, it's still open whether this is possible to do or, or not, even in principle. It, may, it might be that the uh, interstellar matter bends these rays so much that it is not possible to it, 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 it might be, but then again it might not. And we, uh, in order to learn whether this is so, uh, one, one should really measure the spatial distribution of the of, of the sky in, in the radio in low radio frequencies. In other words, one one should build this this type of instruments in order to assess the feasibility, and the same type of instruments could then be used to try to detect these exponents, it's a piece of planet, so so. How much time do I have? It's here, bro. I've been taking the time, but it's been a little more. Okay, then, then, yeah, then, then, uh, I mean, then, 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 some kind of spider, I mean, if you put an antenna in space, it has to be some kind of spider net or something like that. It has a, a, a wire mesh reflector, and Possibly another satellite, which, and this is the, which is the receiver. And what is interesting here is that uh, if one really calculates theoretically how, what is the minimum mass needed to build this kind of system, it turns out to be surprisingly small. So, order of one kilogram per square kilometer. I mean, this estimate come, comes from the fact that the, the wire must have a minimum thickness in order to reflect radio waves. That depends on the conductivity of the wire. And the mesh spacing is also dictated by the, it must be a, there is a maximum mesh spacing in order to let the radio waves. So you calculate this kind of that amount of cover or whatever in this kind of mesh, you end up with the value which is, but of course this doesn't include any, 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 this technical, this support structure. But I should, yeah. Can I ask? Yes. Collecting aerial elements, we are not. Yeah, uh, yes. Would be something that would already be enough for detecting uh, the, this sort of emission. Yes, possibly yes. You pointed out that the emission is so such a low frequency that it's not be, uh, passing through the frequency. Yeah, yes, but, but also the depends on the strength of the magnetic field of the planet. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm not so aware about the sensitivity of the, the presently existing radio telescope, but are the as a one tenth of this collecting area along the yes. about. Yes. If one is lucky, I mean, the frequency as well as uh, mm. uh, intensity or, or the, the incoming flux, one would be even in already. Uh, already, yeah, yes, if you are very lucky. If there's a very strongly magnetized planet, which is close enough to the star so that the solar wind is strong and the emission is intense, and you are happening to observe at the right moment when, when there is a magnetic storm on, on the planet. Okay. You know, but, but it, I mean, we have much bigger arrays than this, and the very large arrays are in Mexico. And it's much bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But not in front of the electric area. Yes, yeah. Oh, so so oh. We have it as a code that will be because it's no report. What's that? We have it as a code that will be because it's no report. Just because of the IMS. Yes, and I, I think also IMS will be difficult because of the IMS. Mm -hmm. Probably IMS yeah. will not have the end of it. Okay, I just put my conclusion. Thank you. You can ask the question why the BUM. Yes.
Uh, I was just wondering, you, uh, there were some, uh, you mentioned a couple of web pages which were obviously related to the NOFA project. Oh, yeah, yes. Um, the, uh, I don't know, um, this is a large, yeah, low frequency radio array which is planned here in Europe. Yes, so be yes. A base with the connecting area, I guess, of several square kilometers. Yes, I don't remember. But anyway, because of the iron sphere, it can't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is lucky. At least uh, the, the, the I mean, frequency, but at least the sensitivity might be right on the, in the right range to be able to pick yeah, up. Yes, sensitivity would be. Besides the frequency, yeah, yes, sensitivity would be enough, probably. But the uh, atmosphere distorts the ray path, which makes kind of, it, it's much more severe effect than the interstellar. Okay. But of course, low fire is the state of the art at the moment. But it depends on really that. Uh, have, have you worked out the uh, necessary angular resolution? I mean, you are up against, yes, uh, up against the radium uh, I would continuum. Say that, yes, I mean, I would say that you, you, you would need an interferometer with a baseline, maybe, let's say, 1,000 kilometers or something like that. Okay, then then your satellite idea would, yeah, you wouldn't need a, work. No, but you, you need several of them. You need several of those satellites. This, this is what kind of one. This is kind of one of those. You, you need a few. For instance, orbiting the moon, mm. and when they are behind the moon, then they are, I mean, they are safe from the Earth. Uh, well, they are completely safe. Uh, they can put them on the moon. Uh, that has that has been proposed, but I would say that I would think that then you have to support them against gravity, and I would say that it's much more expensive to do that than to put them in free space. But no, no, no. why? Uh. Because if you really need to, to uh, keep, keep distances between uh, uh, satellite systems to make any sense of armor, so you run into enormous expenses in, uh, in uh, attitude control and yes. so on. But, 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 but if you, if you put them on a solid body, yes. you gain a lot of, uh, of uh, structure. Yeah. But, but on the other people are uh, existing devices like Darwin, where they have to do interference with the infrared. Yeah, but that's it's only 10 meters, and the plans are doing with the moon. Yes, but, but, but the accuracy quality is much bigger in the infrared, I mean. Oh, yes, but they do it with the moon. Yes, aha. Uh -huh. okay, but here we need only a few meters accuracy, because you need maybe 10% of the wave, <coughs> or the 100 meter accuracy. It's, it's, it's not, not that severe. Mm -hmm. Could you? Yes, yes, yes. This is a main on the relations between this and, and the talks before about the detection of uh, exoplanets, where it was very impressive, I thought, that you could, in within 10 or 15 years, maybe see the continents of this, on this, this planet. So, yeah. And in comparison to that, this seems to be a more primitive in, in the detection of the uh, habitable planets. Yes, of course. I mean, the interesting thing about this magnetic thing is that, uh, or this overall thing is that this is the only way to obtain information about the magnetic field of the planet. So it's kind of complementary to these other approaches. But is it the same continents? Is it that indication now that you have to have I, I, well, I, I don't think we'll see those continents in 10 years, actually. I guess that was a bit too optimistic. Yeah. Uh, maybe so we will, if I understand correctly, maybe we'll see the planets in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then maybe after 10 years we, we are designing instruments that might be able to take some images. Okay, so let's send it.